Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Conversations That Cure, a panel discussion on behalf of Mental Health Declassified. Y'all are uh, familiar, old friends, and hopefully some new friends uh, learning about Mental Health Declassified. Mental Health Declassified is all about promoting the awareness and um, pushing for the normalization of mental health discussions um, and wellness just around our uh, mental health. And so today I'm super excited to be here as your moderator. My name is Dr. Maritza Barros, and I am here to moderate this conversation with my lovely panelists. I've got four individuals joining me. We've got like an international conversation going on right here, or should I say a, a, a global, a national a representation of perspectives. And it's so exciting because y'all know May is Mental Health Awareness Month. And, you know, Mental Health Declassified, they are not new to this. They are true to this, right? This is what they do every day. The normalization in their circles and in their communities, their networks is definitely there. And so today is an opportunity for us to celebrate and to amplify, right? And just um, today, we're going to be here to demonstrate and model what normalizing this conversation looks like and sounds like. So I'm super excited to get to know the panelists who are here with me today, for y'all to hear their perspective. And hopefully you all um, get some, most of all, I'm going to say courage, courage and empowerment to express yourself, um, to be okay with not being okay sometimes and knowing that that's normal, that's actually part of life. Nobody is perfect and we live in our imperfections. Uh, today, we're going to be exploring questions about what it means to talk about mental health, uh, what our experiences have been like when we've tried to challenge the status quo, especially um, within our circles, our families, and the cultural dynamics that are presented when it comes to sharing your feelings, expressing yourself, um, even maybe a little bit of that trajectory in even being able to identify what you feel, right? To then get the courage to express it and uh, the empowerment to live within the new boundaries and standards that you have for yourself as you are adulting, right? In this life. So I'm super excited to get started. I wanna offer just some grounding for us in having this conversation because um, it's not everyday conversations that we do have there are sensitive um, subject matters or topics that come up and there there's trauma, right? That we live with and that we're dealing with. And so we wanna just be intentional in how we show up in these conversations with each other and for one another. So I'm gonna share a few things I'm gonna ask y'all to do with me. Uh, the first thing is to just let's, clear our minds for a minute, right? It's 7 p. It's past 7 p.m. at this point, and it's been a long day, right? We've worked. We, If we have children, we've, you know, fed our children and getting them settled and getting ourselves here. So there's a lot on our minds. Some of us might be a little nervous even being in these uh, seats to have these conversations. So I want us to take a mindful moment, focus on our breath and just really clear our minds and just um, get calm in this moment together. So this is actually a, a great practice any day, any time in your day that you feel like you need a moment or you're having transitions, right? Take a mindful moment. And all that means is I'm going to invite y'all to plant your feet flat on the ground in your, in your chair or standing up, whatever's comfortable for you. You can uh, close your eyes or drop your head. Again, whatever's comfortable. But what we're going to do is just focus on our breath, okay? We're going to take deep breaths in and deep breaths out. Wherever your mind goes, any thoughts that wander or travel in, just dismiss them and get back to focusing on your breathing. The way in which we're going to breathe is we're going to take four deep breaths in and then four deep breaths out. And we're gonna do four rounds of that intentional deep breathing. And then I'll bring us back together with the sound of my voice. All right, so let's take a mindful moment.
All right. Beautiful, beautiful. I don't know about y'all, but that always does it for me. Just clearing the mind and getting centered around our conversation today. And, you know, mental health is a, it's a cognitive mind factor, but we know that our mind and bodies and spirits are all connected. And so you definitely have to be mindful of um, the physiology as well, right? Connect that heart to the mind, especially in these conversations. So conversations that cure, I just, just a little uh, history or background on how uh, conversations that cure came about. It, honestly, it's just out of the, the sheer desire of having conversations, um, addressing things that are more challenging or difficult in ways that we've never really been able to, um, in ways that we haven't been taught to, and even our parents generationally may not have the skill sets to give us right and so it's like it's not that this one conversation is going to cure us but the act of having these conversations and expressing ourselves and being transparent about our feelings will lead to that healing right and that cure of the trauma um that we've inherited right whether intentionally or unintentionally and it's an opportunity for us to create a safe space um, also creating a space for bravery and people to be courageous enough to, to say things. Sometimes you've got to say things in um, safe circles to be able to get that courage to say it in, in situations where you feel like there's more at risk, right? So we understand um, it may not be for everyone. We know that therapy is obviously the professional way Everyone should have a therapist, um, but that's not the only place you're going to have that type of engagement, right? It's like going to school or going to training at work. You can't only participate in that learning at those trainings. You also have to find other ways to practice and engage um, to, to sort of develop this muscle. And so um, we're just here to try to create a supportive community, share experiences, we're not claiming to be experts, but we are the experts of our lives, right? And if we can inspire um, others to be courageous and give new language to folks who didn't have it before, validate people for how they're feeling, when especially they're in spaces where that validation is not there, um, and an opportunity for us to create space for us to offer one another advice without the fear of criticism, right? And so to be able to do that, we really want to ground ourselves in some shared agreements. Um, shared agreements is a great way for us to um, hold each other accountable for being responsible to how you show up in the space, right? The intentionality of the language you use, the tone in which you speak, um, asking folks to come from an area of growth mindset, not enacting a, a cancellation um, culture, if you will. So I have a few shared agreements I love to offer in today's conversation. Um, we obviously want to be respectful of um, the privacy, though this is being recorded. So what's said here is going to go wherever this video goes. So please keep that in mind. Um, but it's always something to be mindful of is that confidentiality. It's always great to take the learning from conversation spaces outside of that space, but what's um said and who said it and you know that those explicit content should remain within that conversation group the other is to use i statements right we can only speak on behalf of ourselves we know that no one group or culture or any people are a monolith and so we recognize that we have to speak on behalf of ourselves and then also recognize that as you're taking advice and hearing things from other people that is very the Things that they are expressing are very unique to their lived experience and you can be inspired by, but recognize that the truth and the power lies within you, right? Um, and what's best for you when you decide to apply things in your own life. Step up and step back. We're definitely gonna be looking for um, folks to chime in, offer any questions. So for our audience, we welcome that. We'll be keeping an eye out on the chat. But for my panelists, definitely keep a, um, a tally on how often you're speaking and, and 
implement this step up and step back shared agreement so that we can hear um, from every voice on our panel. Uh, we're gonna be respectful to differences of opinions, right? Um, it's us versus the conflict or the matter at hand. It's not a personal piece. So we're gonna keep that respect and an open mind to learn across our differences. And then finally, it's okay to not be okay, right? It, it, it's okay to even name um, that you're feeling a particular way, but you haven't resolved the next steps or um, what a solution might be. And that's okay to just acknowledge it. So just some, some um, shared agreements to help us situate the conversation. The last piece, just to get us grounded before we dive into our questions and first of all, introducing our panelists, um, it, it's, it would be remiss of us not to offer a trigger warning. We hope not to trigger folks, but we don't know what trigger points could be for anyone. So in these conversations, it, it's not always the case that you can lean into the discomfort. We're gonna expect um, that discomfort is going to be a part of this and vulnerability is something that we have to be empowered or encourage ourselves to um, lean into. But if things are getting too hot and heavy for you, you need to take a moment. We ask that you take the space and the time that you need. Um, we also ask that if you actually need more support than just um, you know a timeout or a break from the conversation, Send us a chat, reach out to us uh, via our mental health declassified email contacts or on social media so we can get you some resources for um, support beyond this space. How's that sound, panelists? Awesome. I was just going to say, can I get a thumbs up? <laughs> All right, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen now so I can see our beautiful panel. So y'all, I mentioned that we have a uh, panelist representing uh, different states in, in the US and we have someone out of the country. So I really wanna take the time right now uh, to share a little bit about who's here. And I'm gonna see who'd like to kick us off. Um, who'd like to introduce themselves first from our panel? Megan? Megan, come off mute and let us know who you are, where you are chiming in from. Hi, everyone. My name is I'm a two time TEDx speaker and mental health advocate for college students. I am tuning in from Austin, Texas, lovely Austin, Texas. Um, it's a really cool city. I love it. I've been here for, I would say, a year and eight months. Um, I love traveling around and I think when you can run your own business and being 28 and you know young and single and just in a good space I'm like I like living in new cities for the experience and for trying new things so I've lived all over like LA Nashville Miami and now Austin um so I like I said I'm a two-time TEDx speaker and mental health advocate for college students I have been doing this for so long I mean truly it's been almost a decade I've been speaking, which is crazy. I started when I was really young. Um, I did not go to college. I knew my passion was being a public speaker and talking about mental health. And really, I call it giving a voice to the voiceless because I think mental health, let's be real, throughout our whole lives, we all will have moments, you know, waves of like feeling anxious and stressed and burned out and too, that's just life. That's being an adult. It's like, I always call it being an adult is like a balancing act. Like you're on a unicycle juggling six balls at once. All of them are on fire. It can feel so overwhelming. Um, but what I've realized in my own journey with anything related to anxiety or feeling not good enough, it's like, you just, you realize you're not alone. And that kind of takes the lid off of like, you're like, oh, everyone kind of feels this way at some points. And it's like, of course we're all human. Um, but yeah, so I'm really excited to be here today. I'm good friends with Brandon and I was on Angelica's podcast. Um, and I just love talking about mental health. So yeah, I'm Megan and really pumped up to be here. Thanks, Megan. You want to popcorn it over to another panelist? 
Ooh, I know. I'm like, who do I put on the spot? Um, maybe um, Angelica, since I know you. Yeah. <laughs> I figured that was coming my way. Um, but thank you. So nice to be here. My name is Angelica Galuzzo, and I am the international one. I'm from just north of Toronto here in Canada. Um, I am a one-time TEDx speaker. Haven't hit two like Megan yet, but was super it was like the best experience of my life. So super glad I get to say that. Um, I'm a podcast host. Also, I host the Revolutionized Mind podcast, which is sponsored by Mental Health Declassified, which is how I got connected with Brendan. Brendan was also on my podcast, so shout out to him. Um, and yeah, just a general mental health advocate, always posting online and sharing my story and more general struggles that most of us go through. I'm just really passionate about sharing I call it like the darkest parts of the human experience and just bringing them to light because so many people are going through things that they might not be talking about or not, might not be ready to acknowledge yet and I love being the vulnerable one might as well just put yourself out there and bring it to the light so super happy to be here and continue to do that um, and I will hand it off to Ashley who is another podcast host awesome thank you welcome What's up, everyone? My name is Ashley Edwards. I am the founder of Splash of Ash LLC, which is a multimedia mental health and wellness brand that focuses on all the little things like our self-talk and our routines, our daily habits, all the things that we can do every single day to level up our minds, level up our lives, and just get us feeling grounded. So I loved the breathing we did because I needed that before getting into this space. I am a podcast host and I also am excited to launch a coaching platform as well. I have my master's in clinical mental health counseling. I didn't go on to um, get my license, but I do love this space. I love these conversations. I love getting vulnerable and talking about all these things so we can help ourselves learn and grow and transform and in turn help other people as well. So super stoked to be here. Can't wait to share. And thanks for having me. Awesome. Thank you. And you're going to pass it to Good luck. <laughs> Am I listening? I'm going to, I'm going to go with Abraham. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Safe, <laughs> yeah, safe bet. Uh, but yeah, my name is Ibrahima, Abraham Sisei, and I founded a company called Freedom Project, and I'm still trying to figure out what it is. It's an agency right now, uh, but my background is in advertising. I played professional soccer and I, and I didn't cut it. I didn't make the cut. So I went into advertising because so I've, I've always worked with agents all the time. So I figured I would go work in something that I know. However, while I was in the agency world, that's when I learned that the work that I, I was doing was impacting people's mental health, especially with kids. And I almost said, all right, I'm going to figure out how to build an agency that supports mental health. So right now, I have a, I, I have a couple of curriculums that, are, that, that we're trying to get into schools across the U.S., uh, and we do conferences to make sure that schools are aware of it. So... Um, I have a conference coming up this month, uh, at the end of the month, and I'm planning a bigger one next year. Uh, but right now, the, the the goal is to get kids educated about things that we like consume online uh, because we're, we're we're always on our phones nowadays, and all, all of these platforms and the algorithms are designed, which I am part of in my past. Uh, you know, actually creating algorithms to make sure that people can stay on platform. So I'm, I'm trying to re-engineer that to make sure that we can educate kids at a very young age about mental health, about how to cope, because we do live in a very, very anxious world today uh, where, you know, we're getting bombarded by everything, you know. <laughs> so we need to make sure that uh, people have the resources to learn about mental health. Me, personally, the reason why I made the switch is because uh, I was dating someone and then I learned that I was toxic, which was mind-blowing because <laughs> I thought I was always the nice guy. I, I ended up finding out that the way that I was behaving around her was limiting her her her, her friend group, her world. Because again, I did grow up in Africa. I moved here in a completely different culture. And the, and the way that her, you know, you know, she behaves around people was weird to me. Weird to me. Uh, <laughs> so I was very controlling apparently. And so I was able to get called out by her. Thank God. That kind of changed my, my, my entire perspective. But how I interact with people, how I see people. Uh, so I've made it my goal, a secondary goal, apart from education, is to make sure that every man that I come across, uh, we can all understand how we behave and how 
the way that we treat other people and and how far that impact you know can actually go. Um, except Drake, I'm I'm playing. <laughs> I'm playing. <laughs> Sorry, Canada. I I just had to get that out there. But yeah, so that's what I do uh, right now: education around mental health, uh, and then also figuring out what the company is all about right now. But yeah. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you, all of you, for your introductions and revealing all the richness in your perspectives and the expertise that y'all bring. I can tell this is going to be a great, great conversation. Um, as y'all were speaking, I'm thinking about um, self. I, I was thinking about it because obviously, as we're preparing for this panel, y'all too were probably rehearsing in your head what you wanted to share, what we might think about, uh, speak on. And I was thinking self-awareness, self-regulation and self-accountability. And I think uh, you just touched upon that. Um, Ibrima, 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 you, thank you, you just touched upon that in regards to your short story that you just shared. Uh, and that's so critical and important in this work or conversations about mental health because Ultimately, the power lies with us, right? The burden is on us, but the power also li lies in us in that um, mindset and our attitude, right? Determines our altitude. So I appreciate that quick story and what we were able to get just from that. So I'm excited for what's more to be shared. Um, I didn't even introduce myself and background. So just I'll just add really quickly. Uh, currently, I'm teaching uh, at Tufts University in the areas of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and justice leadership. It's also what I do for consulting work, so working with organizations um, to implement um, equitable and inclusive practices, and a lot of work around learning and development. So super excited to be here with y'all, though, who seem to have more of a narrow focus specifically into mental health. So let's dive in, y'all. Y'all ready for some questions? Y'all ready to be vulnerable and honest? <laughs> All right. So the first question I'm going to dive into is going to tap into um, experience uh, that brought some insight to you in your life, right? So my first question is if, and anyone can start us off, um, but can you describe a moment when an open conversation about mental health significantly changed your outlook? or well-being, um, in Ibrahim, I think you you just shared that in your intro, but what was the key takeaway from that experience from any? any yeah, so, yeah. Um, and I can start uh, uh, since I just touched on it. Um, even in my experience, when I, when I initially went to therapy, it was because of the girlfriend back then who said I was toxic. And I would say, okay, let me go figure out um, what this means. And I remember when I went to therapy, the, the, the reason why I kept on going is because my therapist kind of, you know, like identified that I, I personally, I identify with the things that I do. And somehow, you know, I, I think I'm on top of the world because I, I played soccer professional. I traveled all over the world and that's who I am. And this is something that even me and Brandon talked about, you know, like talked about a few times. Uh, that most of us identify with the things that we do and hence we like project that energy in conversations in in the way that we view you know society as a whole but that's why nowadays when you go to you know like events everyone is saying like what do you do for work uh, but we are more than that we are more than our experiences uh, they are just experiences this is something that I was able to connect was that my you know, my experiences are not who I am. They're things that I am going through as a person. Uh, however, uh, I am Ibrahima, Abraham. That's actually another name that I had to drop because my parents were just wild. <laughs> but, you know, I am not this is the guy who played soccer because, you know, I lost the soccer and, and it took me a while to, like, recover from that, you know, identity crisis. And, and then from, from there, you know, I became, you know, like one of the media buyers for like Marvel and then I, I got let go of that and I was lost and it's like okay who am I so going to therapy and being able to identify that that I am not this profession I am not this guy who plays soccer I am in Brahma Abraham CC the guy who's doing this right now and it's just an experience and that's what it is yeah definitely thank you so much for for adding to that anyone want to contribute yeah I I think of the power of listening 
and opening up our ears. And what I thought about was when you're on like an airplane and you hear, you know, some people talking about stuff going on in their world or um, at work, uh, my coworkers talking about, I, I call them the, the monkeys in our heads when they chatter and they tell us lies and crazy things. And we tend to believe them even though we shouldn't. Um, when, when we're listening, we can understand that there are so many people who struggle. There are so many people who are going through things that we don't even know about. And we see them on airplanes and grocery stores coming through our work doors, whatever it is. And we say, Hey, how are you? And we move on, we move forward. Um, sometimes we don't even mean, how are you? Cause we all just say good and carry on with our day. And we could be having the worst day in the whole world and no one's there to listen. Um, so, so my takeaway is we have to listen. We have to be willing to listen to people and we have to understand that everyone's going through something. Everyone's been through a season. Everyone has a story. And I think that that's, that's really special because we all share that with each other. So, yeah. that, so that's my thought. No, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. It's a great takeaway. I, I, I think um, we, we can only do what we know, right? And the best with what we've uh, been raised um, or the environments and communities that have exposed us to particular ways of thinking, you know, the way what you're talking about, that monkey in your in your in your brain, um, it comes from it's it's developed through things that we've seen, heard, uh, messages that are reinforced, right, in the household or through media that's embedded in this dominant um ideology, right, within within this this society we live in. Talk to me though about like when when did you have that awakening of like I'm not just in the conditioning of my upbringing like now I'm in my conscious mind what was what was there an exact experience or was it something you read or an experience or conversation you had that had you awaken to the fact that I need to be compassionate and actively listen um, and start thinking more deliberately about my mental health. You no, know, it's so interesting because I really relate to um, Abraham. I'm going to stay safe in your name. I'm so sorry. I don't want to mispronounce it. Um, <laughs> get vulnerable, right? I don't want to mispronounce it. Um, so for me, I can relate to the soccer player because I was a soccer player in high school, blew out my knee, had three surgeries, could never go back and play. And I was, that was my identity. So it's interesting that we us three were soccer players. Um, and I really resonated with that. And once it, it felt like it was ripped from me, I was like, who the heck is Ashley? Like, who is she? What does she want to do? And I discovered that I was also more than just the soccer player that wants to play in college and do these big things with soccer. So I had to get outside of my box and do different things, hobbies. And I found coaching, um, special needs kids in soccer was where, I was passionate in high school and that to me, it gave me a different perspective and I got to be grateful for who I am and, and the, the gifts that I have and what I can share. And so for me, it was getting outside my box of what I knew, which was soccer, soccer, this tournaments go here, work hard. And once I stepped outside of who I thought I was or, or what I thought my sole identity was for being on this planet, that's when I could really experience and give myself grace and dive into some of the things that, that I am, you know, passionate about and, and find, you know, what I want to do in this world. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it sounds like hitting rock bottom was it for you to, to really yeah. make you face yourself. Um, and it's so interesting that that's what propelled you into your purpose right? And now you're shining and, and uh, influencing others and, and helping others in the process. Um, so it's just a reminder that sometimes we do have to go through some darkness to get to the light, right? And that that too is part of this journey of the ups and downs we, we've named in, um, in this game we call life. Crazy game. Crazy game, <laughs> yes. Um, anyone else want to share a, a specific experience or awakening aha moment that really uh, sort of changed your outlook about your well-being? 
Yeah, I can jump in and I can strongly relate to everything Ashley was just saying, especially with the soccer and the injury piece, which I'm sure we can chat about later. Um, but the experience that came to my mind is a little bit more directly related to advocacy. Um, I'm not sure if you folks are familiar with the Safe Talk workshop, which is a suicide prevention workshop offered through LifeWorks. It is an international program. Um, so I took that course in my third year of university. And at that point, I was already sharing a bit of my story online. I was already about seven years deep in my own struggle with mental health and mental illness. I've gone through a few rocky times. So it came at like a weird stage in my advocacy journey, I would say. But sitting there in that workshop, all about suicide prevention and me having struggled with similar things in the past, it was the first time I ever heard the word suicide and the topic of suicide talked about so openly and not in a positive light, but in a way that we can do something about it. There are tools, there are resources in place. These are the skills we can teach you in order to support people in your life. And it was a four hour workshop. And I remember that day just going home and like bawling my eyes out. Mm. That was like, holy crap, like these things exist. It, didn't have to be such a hush hush thing like the word suicide itself doesn't have to be whispered and you know like it can be talked about openly and directly and that is one of the biggest things that lead towards suicide prevention is being able to talk about it yeah. so that was such a crucial part in my advocacy journey that led me towards sharing my story more openly literally talking about it in a TEDx talk on that big of a stage and I mm -hmm. think that's just been such a key part in my mind always looking back at just being that like that experience had such a profound impact on me and something that I want to continue and I actually did become a safe talk trainer last year because I just I love the course so much and I think teaching those skills to other people in your community can just continue the impact so yeah a little more directly related to that but a yeah. big impact for sure. I love that. I love that impact through your own learning and then it's inspiring you to to support the learning of others, like paying it forward in a true sense. Um, thank you. So Megan, I, I want to bring you in into the next question. If we can if we can go into the next question, because you know, when it comes to um training, let's just talk about training, right? When we are needing to work out. We're talking about wellness in general. You need to work out, you get a trainer, right? Mm -hmm. To go with you to the gym or give you a workout schedule, a regimen. If you're needing to eat well and watch, you know, you are what you eat. So when you get serious, yes. you get a nutritionist, right? Even if you're trying to learn how to activate what I do, um, in particularly in activating your equity and inclusion lens, you might get a DEIJ con uh, coach, when it comes to mental mental health, what we seek out for professional help is a therapist, yeah. right? But a therapist has this stigma in our society that it's gotten so bad, right? And that you don't have the emotional uh, capacity to, you know, resolve what it is you're dealing with. And so we think that it becomes a thing of, of real illness or sickness. Like you've got to be diagnosed or something to go see a therapist. And maybe this is my own perception and lens that I'm I'm speaking for myself, right? My eye statement. Exactly. Um, the, that stigma. Talk to me about um, what it is. First of all, what, what broke that for you when it comes to working with or seeing a therapist, um, if you do? And what, yeah. what would you say to someone else, right? Who may be in that mindset that I just described, like, Mm -hmm. our people don't believe my culture we don't do therapists like we just push through mm -hmm. what, what are some encouraging words you can offer um, to someone who who might be hesitant to seek professional support yeah that is a great question I would say definitely just know that when you decide to seek help and be vulnerable it, it really means you're strong. Like when I was younger, to me, I thought it meant that I was so weak. And I like, I just, it made me want to like throw, I just hated it. I was like, it's like, no, I want to be strong. Like, I know I can do it. And 
I've realized like when you talk about your feelings and when you share your vulnerabilities, it really means that you're actually brave. Like to me, it takes strength and bravery and courage to choose to seek therapy or to go on medication or to like all of us right now, to me, all of us are so brave because we're talking about scary topics. Like it's not easy to talk about trauma and stuff that you've been through and suicide and depression, but it means that you're brave. And to me, it's like, I would say my best tip is just to know that you're really helping yourself. You're doing, you're, you're giving yourself such a gift when you decide to get help and to open up. Um, and like, I just remember there were so many moments in my life, specifically two years ago when I was living in Miami, um, I went through a traumatic event, um, involving a man and it was really traumatizing just as a female. And thankfully I, I was not, you know, sexually abused or anything, but it was very emotionally, you know, very traumatizing, um, being verbally assaulted and verbally attacked. And it shook me up for so long. And that had never happened to me in my whole entire life with a man. Um, and I think I got therapy right away. And I was like, Thankfully, from my upbringing, I was raised in a household where my parents were always like, when you go through stuff, you talk about it, you know, you don't bottle it up, you express it. So I have a very, I feel like, healthy outlook on therapy and just talking about things. I'm such an open book, too. Like, when I go through stuff, I'm always like, we're getting help. We talk about it. We open up to our community and support. And I think a lot of how we cope with things as adults it comes from our childhood. So for me, I grew up in a certain family, community, household, religion, right? Where all it molds you into the adult that you become, all these conditionings and teachings. So if I had grown up in a family where it was like, you know, hush, hush, walking on eggshells, a little toxic and your nervous system is like so used to like, we don't talk about stuff. And it means, I mean, that would be terrible. And I can't even imagine, but truly, I always think of it like this we're born like blank clean slates and then little things the happenings the doings the teachings imagine like play-doh fresh out of a can right nothing has touched it it's like growing up you know your parents teach you this about love mold about money mold your community your religion your everything that happens to you from ages like zero to seven it's just molds you and all of a sudden you could hit 25 and you're like wait you look in the mirror one day and you're like, I don't even reckon, like, who have I become? Kind of like what, what happened? I felt like I was on autopilot for the last 25 years. So for me, I, I feel grateful that my upbringing was very positive and really supportive regarding like, you talk about things, communicate, you're not alone, kind of dig yourself up, if you will, like exercise, therapy, make your bet, like really just, oh, I'm a huge wellness advocate. Um, and I, do all the cold plunges, all that stuff. But I would say my biggest tip is, is just to know that like, you are only helping yourself. The more that you choose to seek help and community, you're only making your life better when you're honest with yourself. Because, you know, you could lie to just about like everyone, but you can't lie to yourself. At the end of the day, when you're looking in the mirror and you're brushing your teeth about to go to bed, yeah. and if you're in that job where you're unhappy, you're in the under relationship that's a little toxic, you're unhappy, and you're just kind of like, oh, I'm fine. This is what being an adult is. To me, I'm like, you are only going to live a happier, more authentic life by being honest with yourself. And you're only helping yourself. That's something that has helped me view it is like no one else is winning. You're the only one that's going to win when you decide to get help and therapy and just know that you're not alone. Every adulting is so hard. <laughs> like I, at least every week, once a week, I have a mini cry sesh, but it's so healthy. It's like, you need that outlet. It's hard to juggle everything and, you know, showing up and having a job and managing your mental health and fitness and eating healthy, taking all the vitamins and being a good sister, daughter, friend, and doing everything. It's like, we all have moments when we're like, this is just too much. And I need a moment for myself, but honor that. Like, that's what life is about. It's a marathon. You know what I mean? It's like, it is not a sprint and everyone has their own bandwidth too. That's something that I've realized is do not compare your bandwidth to other people's bandwidth. Some people can handle this. Some people can handle that. Some people can handle that. You figure out what your bandwidth is for just 
stress and balancing stuff and it's important to honor it i think it's it's just important yeah to respect what you can handle but just know that like you know just know that you're not alone and i have a therapist still to this day i've been in therapy for years and I love therapy. It's changed my life. And I've done EMDR too, which is a trauma healing technique. I love EMDR. Like Yeah, heard about that. I don't know. I do it all, but yeah. <laughs> but I appreciate that and, and that's really great um to have it in, in such close proximity and you've had that upbringing where there's been some normalization or at least there's some familiarity or even knowledge of that type. Yeah. Um when it comes to therapy as well, we can't um we can't neglect uh, access as a barrier and challenge for some folks to be able to Mm -hmm. consistently have a therapist in their life. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, for one, definitely had that experience growing up where we, we didn't, we, we did bottle things up. We didn't talk about uh, difficult things. Um, You're kind of told to suck it up, deal with it type of attitude. So for any of the other panelists who can relate from um, that lived experience, what do you and how do you get someone to go seek out therapy who never really heard about that aside from a a very formal um, medical sort of angle? Maybe someone who doesn't necessarily have the the means to pay a copay once a week to Mm -hmm. sit with the therapist. What are are some encouraging thoughts uh, or advice that others can offer? Yes. Yeah, yeah, so- um, oh, so no, go ahead. Go ahead, Ashley. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, so um, uh, so like the work that I th- that I normally do right now, it's all like designed, especially men, to, to like help us go see a therapist. Because we are all, as a, I feel like men as a community, we need therapy. Just facts. Um, uh, that's, that's uh, <laughs> That's another layer, right? Of, of just... <laughs> no, I, you know, it's it, it's like something that I share all the time whenever I'm like, you know, like hanging out with my friends. And, and then, you know, I do a lot of micro events throughout the year uh, um, where it's designed for people to come in and figure out how to go to therapy. And we actually pay for the first six sessions because, you know, I've built a network of therapists across the U.S. Uh, and the reason why I have the conference is to actually celebrate the people doing the work within the mental health space. Uh, And that's how I'm able to build a network of therapists and to be able to also pay, you know, not have have them worry about the insurance mess because I think it's all a mess. And uh, yeah, so I have a lot of nonprofits as well that are added to that partnership because they they all get funded from a federal and a state level. However, they don't really know what to do. And they they all, they all don't want, you know, they want to make sure that they keep getting funded. So, I put together all these events as in a, you know, you know, like an avenue for people to figure out how to go see a therapist and not have to worry about costs. Cause I think that's a big problem. And then on the other side, a lot of therapists are also like, look, we also have a profession and whenever something happened, you know, for example, a shooting, everybody was like, go see a therapist, but no one is saying, okay, what about the therapist themselves? Uh, mm-hmm. they, they, you know, people are expecting them for them to do for free. Uh, but it's like, you know, they're, they're essential workers. They're very much needed. Uh, and, uh, but on a personal level, I, I struggle with my own family to even have them go see a therapist. Uh, Cause I did a video about uh, eight years ago, just sharing my story, which involved my family. Uh, and so right now I'm hated by the whole family because <laughs> I am the outlier. I'm the one who went out and then share my story. And my story is very yeah. heavy. Uh, yeah. You know, I went through some really, really dark things as a kid, which um, no kid should ever go through. And, you know, from it, I, I'm trying not to traumatize, you know, people yeah. watching. So I went through some really, really dark things. And soccer was the only outlet that I had or football uh, was the only outlet that I had where it was safe for me. That's why I had that identity crisis when I lost that. Uh, but um what I continually kept doing is to tell my story uh, as as bold as possible. And I did see a few people in my family that actually are like reconnected with me again because they're realizing that, oh, this is a problem. We should deal with this. Uh, and even, even you know, my team players back, um, you know, especially the ones in Norway right now, 
when I did that video, a bunch of them reached out and then they were like, we were going through this too. Like, what, why haven't we never talked about this? I was like, because we don't have the space to talk about this. Um, yeah. You know, we're, we're all being told to just go play, play. So what I continually do is tell my stories on a personal level and hope that uh, other people can connect, a man or woman, everybody that, that has the opportunity, that I can get the opportunity to get in touch with or connected with. Uh, and then on the professional side, the work that I do, uh, you know, I, I try to go above and beyond to figure out how to even pay for those counseling sessions. You know, we had a very unfortunate shooting in Kansas City back in February, uh, and I was able to partner with a bunch of therapists and I brought in a bunch of nonprofits. And then they were able to see as many people as possible for, for six months for free. And those people are still seeing those counselors, but the counselors are getting paid, you know, fairly because it's a very hard, you know, taxing, like emotionally hard labor to keep hearing stories of trauma constantly. Uh, and, you know, we, and then, uh, and the, the reason why I keep making the personal and the professional, which, which I hope people pick up is do not identify with either. I'm, I'm just living these experiences to make sure that I can protect my own mental health to be able to continue doing this work because it's a lot. <laughs> it's yeah, so you're, you're practicing what you're preaching, right? Um, doing it for yourself and then creating space for others. What I love about what you shared was some of the truth about being a truth speaker mm -hmm. that we don't often talk about. So we talk about going to therapy because that's, a healthy thing to do. It's a healthy practice, which it is. And that's where we're going to improve. We're going to gain new skill sets, but we don't often talk about the risk and mm -hmm. the, the potential loss that might come from when you go to therapy, you reveal these particular things and then how you have to act. Mm -hmm. now, now that you know something, you can't just pretend like you don't know, and you've got to create changes. You have new boundaries and it's the dynamics of what it does to the closest relationships to you. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's such a beautiful truth that you just spoke um, and you continuing to be brave enough to share your story, whether people share it with you or not, like you are definitely empowering people to be more courageous in their own journey, mm -hmm. right? What, what, can you add anything more about how you managed in, in sort of choosing yourself? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, you know, I actually do a lot of podcast conversation about the cost of mental health because um, <laughs> we all talk about mental health, but there's a huge cost to it. And, and, and to me, the way that I manage that is, is I make sure that when I tell my story, I'm not saying it in a way that I'm trying to get anything out of it. Because I think sometimes we get lost in the cost of it because we're hoping to get something out of it. But the thing is, the story is our story. And we have to always remember, uh, either at a conscious or a subconscious level, that I'm saying this to make sure that I have a, a you know you know a library of content for myself that I'm always telling the truth about who I am, what I've been through, and how I have I've been able to overcome it, and and know that no one's no one's not gonna care about what you were going to say and keep going. And as someone who works in technology, social media. Uh, you know, like in, in the marketing world, I understand the algorithms. They're designed to make sure that they empower things that brings in attention. And us that are telling our story, it doesn't usually, it's very heavy. Usually it's it's not very exciting. So it doesn't bring attention. So sometimes you may find someone saying some beautiful poetry about their life and then you don't see zero activity. So to me, I see everything I put out as a library for myself to go back and be like, oh yeah, I've already talked about this. Let's let's not talk about that. Oh, actually I talked about this. Let me talk about it again because now I've had a different perspective. So that helps me to not have any expectation that I'm just going to be out there as a, as a loudspeaker talking. No one is listening, but I'm going to say it anyway because I know uh, that it's helping me actually hear myself as I talk. And number two, who who knows? Maybe there's some kid or some 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 like adult that's out there, that that, that that's hearing me some say say things that I've been through and be like, oh wow, I I never thought of it like that, and be like, let me work on this. Uh, so that's how I'm able to cope, and I sleep a lot. So <laughs> it also <laughs> helps. Sleep is very important. <laughs> yeah, well, when you find peace in yourself, uh, it's it's easier to sleep for sure. I appreciate that. So Ashley, I saw that you were coming off mic and I'm, I want to welcome any comments you have, but I also want to pose the next question because I think 
it, it's what you do. You ex you shared what you do for work, and I think this is a perfect question to start off um, with you, Ashley. Um, so therapy is a very you know that's that's the the formal. If we think about education, you have formal education, and you have lived experiences and the day to day stuff that you're doing. So beyond the therapy, can we talk about how? Um, and Ashley, for yourself, but then the, the tips that you might share through your uh, work as well. How do you integrate self-care into your daily routine and how um, has your approach to self-care evolved? Oh, I love this self-care. So we are a product of the things that we do every single day. Um, that's what I believe. That's and right. <laughs> yes, we are a product, you know, who we are today, how we show up today is a product of what we did yesterday. Um, what we chose to do yesterday. And there's so much power in that because there's a lot of things that happen in our world to us, um, for us sometimes that isn't in our control, but there's a lot of things that we can do that are in our control. And so I think that it's powerful to think about what we can do today to level up our mindset, to feel good, to just stay grounded um, and to really love our lives, despite the chaos that might be going on anyway. So for me, I'm all about my morning routine. It's very precious to me and everyone in my world knows that. <laughs> so for me, coffee is a must. Like I I love my coffee and it truly is the thing when my alarm goes off that I'm excited about. So I, it sounds so silly, but there's so much magic in the little things. Um, and we, when we can get our mind to appreciate those little things, a lot can shift in your world. So when my alarm goes off, it's like literally straight to the coffee machine. I just got married in the fall and, um, on my registry, you know, I put a really nice coffee machine that somebody was so generous to get me, but it really does make me happy. Um, when I'm making my coffee and I'm smelling how good it smells, I practice gratitude. Um, I know it's something that everybody talks about and that, it, you know, it might be something that we think, you know, we don't need to do, but grounding in being appreciative for who we are, what we get to do, it really is something that can make a difference in your world. So sometimes I wake up and I'm in a bad mood and I'm like, you know what? I'm just grateful for coffee. And that's all I can think of. And I acknowledge that that's the space that I'm in for today. There are other days where I wake up and I truly embrace that gratitude of, of who I am, what I get to go do. Um, and, and it can be different, but just acknowledging that different mindset that we can be in is important. Giving ourselves grace. I make my bed I think Megan was sharing making my bed or making her bed. Um, I make my bed. It helps me to continue to be productive and to do things. Um, it, it's really, it's, it's a, important for me. And nonetheless, when I get home from work and I see my bed is made, I'm like, oh, it was a good day. So it's a little piece of gratitude there. Um, yeah. Skincare, washing my face, washing off my day, washing just bad sleep off. Like I- a lot imagery is powerful for me. Um, so skincare, taking care of myself, it's super, super important to me. So it's the routines, the things that we do every day. Yeah. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. You're making me think about the fact that, you know, we, we can be such gracious and, and giving people to others. Right. But then when it comes to that, you're talking about the morning routine, it's you and you, you and the universe, you and the God, whoever, however you believe, um, and that the universe pays attention to how you treat yourself. Mm -hmm. And, and that will impact sort of the, the kind of day you have, like you said, and the type of experiences that are attracted in your space. So I, I love that as a reminder, like treat yourself with luxury, right? Because that's what you deserve and that's how you treat others to, to treat you. Um, I love the tips you shared. What other tips do folks have? Angelica? I love this question. So I'm definitely going to jump in. Um, <laughs> also huge proponent of routines. I think making your bed is like the most powerful thing anybody can do every single morning. It has such a big impact on everything in your mind um but another big thing I've like come to learn with self-care I always like to put in brackets is like the idea of intention because mm -hmm. I think self-care has become this like 
you know, take a bubble bath, these Instagrammable activities, but it is so much more than that. And it really is just carving time and energy out of your day to put towards yourself and the things that fill your cup or bring you joy. And it's all about like what you tell yourself going into that. So if you're stressed and you're like, oh, I need to do my self-care today, and maybe you go for a walk, you're not going to get the same benefits as if you were like, oh, I have 20 minutes right now. Let me go move my body and clear my mind for a little bit. Like that mindset going into any activity you do, like intention is just, I think the grounding force and everything, but it's how you perceive that act of self-care. Like I personally love reading and I love sitting outside on my lunch hour and I just like to sit with a good book and that's my time. I tell myself like away from a screen, a little escape from reality, diving into a good book and getting fresh air at the same time. So um, I think intention is a really key piece that should be part of the self-care conversation because it can just level up um, any benefit you're trying to get out of any activity. Absolutely. Intention and gratitude, two very powerful things y'all just named. And and uh, Angelica, you're making me think about what you feed your mind and it ties into what Ashley is saying, right? Like the behaviors you are taking part in today are going to shape your, your tomorrow. And that includes not just what you do, but what you feed your, your mind, right? Any other thoughts on the tips? I know I'd love to hear from everyone to see how expansive we can get. Oh, yeah. I uh, I mean, I can have Mexico go, and I can go next. Go ahead. No, um, sorry. I, okay, my tips I will share. Just to back off of what everyone has said, I'm like, the snaps are here. Yes. yes, to making your bed every morning, I'm the same way. I cannot function unless my bed is made. Same with just like, I'm a self-care queen, routine queen. Even when I travel to me, routines give me structure, discipline. And as someone who, like, I just, my personality type, I thrive off of routine and discipline. So I don't, I'm really militant about it. I don't care if I'm traveling, if it's the weekend, I am taking my morning vitamins, afternoon vitamins, nighttime <laughs> vitamins. You know, I make my bed every morning. I um, either do a cold shower or I'll do ice water on my face. To me, that's important. And I also love caffeine. I caffeine queen. I just love coffee. Um, and I just think it's really important to anytime I have affirmations too. I think that's so healthy because life gets stressful. Every day is so different. And being an entrepreneur, I'm sure a lot of us can relate. Every day is different. Some days we're, you know, inside our apartment or house recording interviews, podcast stuff on Zoom all day long. Other days we're traveling and speaking or networking events. So to me, it's like <clears throat> I have all my affirmations of just all is well. It's all happening for you, not to you. You know, rejection is protection, redirection. And I also say on days when I feel really scattered, I just say like, calm down. Like you're doing a great job. Focus. What needs to get done right now? Just like productive. What needs to happen now or dig yourself up. That's one thing that I love is just, if I feel some emotion, I'm like, Hey, focus on solutions, not excuses, like only solutions, only digging yourself up. So that is, yeah. Making your bed, taking vitamins, exercise, like making sure I feel mentally and physically good. I'm also a huge fitness lover. Fitness is excuse me, um, fitness is incredibly important to me. So yeah. if I don't work out, I, I'm not, my day is just not going to flow. So I like my morning workouts, a walk in nature, just so I can have time for myself. And um, so yeah, my tips would just be just to back off of what everyone else is saying is just routine is so important for your mental health. And in order to be a good employee, CEO, sister, daughter, friend, you got to fill up your cup um, and make sure that you're doing good. And um, I don't know. I always think I always say this too. being a business owner myself. The moment I feel a little bit spread too thin or like I'm just really like burning out. I'm like, I always just say my my mantra is my well-being comes first. So if I feel like I'm overextending or taking on too many things. I'm really clear about it. And I'm just like, okay, that's a no, that's a no, that's a yes, that's a yes. And that's, I think the being a business owner, yeah, being a business owner, a really big part of it is you learn what your bandwidth is 
and you learn just what feels like an automatic yes. And what are things that, yeah, no, no, I don't, I don't have time. And, um, and to not feel guilty about it because the whole over guilting is just, there will always be thousands of events to go to. And it's awesome to work hard, but you have to realize that there will always be so many things to do and to go to. Um, but I always just, yeah, my mental health comes first and I never, ever feel guilty if I need to, you know, push a zoom call, maybe to get an extra hour of sleep in the morning, if I really need it, my well being always comes first. So I think that's, yeah, that's the best tip I could give. Yeah, that that's definitely being self full, right? Um, but yeah. it is, because when you talk about filling your cup, right, we know yeah. Oprah talks about that cup being overflowing, right? Yes. Your cup can't just be full. You've got to be overflowing to be able to pour into others. If not, that's that time to retreat. And what you're offering, folks, I love because you're talking about that self talk, that self coach, yeah. right? Not the monkeys that Ashley talked about, but that 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 good coach that's going to help you in those affirmations that reaffirm who you are, mm-hmm. you know, because every day presents a different thing like Ashley shared, like you might wake up and be like, eh, another day you're like ready to go. But regardless, yeah. having that positive self-talk and being able to coach yourself through yeah. such a great skill to be able to build and yourself. I- Yeah. And not to interrupt you, um, Dr. Barros, but I will add one more thing. And really quickly is I think a lot of us can relate to this too. For me, you know, being a motivational speaker, being this light, this positive person for everyone, I think something that I've learned in the past few years, as I've gotten older and my career has really taken off and I'm speaking more consistently is just, I think sometimes, sometimes I feel, um, really, really, it's challenging when, you know, you are expected or you're supposed to be this positive leader, whatever, you know, change maker catalyst for people. Mm -hmm. But when on the inside, you feel like crummy or when you're going through something really hard, that's been hard for me sometimes, like, you know, speaking in front of hundreds or thousands of people or on a zoom call. And you're like, you know, I love it because it is fulfilling, but you're like, yes, you're amazing. You're do this. But then you're dealing with like, you know, a heartache or grief or some really difficult emotion. Yeah. It's that's something that's really hard is just, I've been learning, like, you know, um, I love helping other people and being of service and I, I don't want to do anything else. Public speaking is my jam, but sometimes it's hard to be that person for other people when you feel like your life is just you're dealing with being a human, you know, it's hard. So it's, it's beautiful. And to hear you say that it is, I'm sure to, to, to folks, um, who may not even be motivational speakers, but they view you as such a strong person and that light, but then to hear you say that really helps humanize you and then normalize for them what they might be feeling. Right. Yeah. And, and then that reminder that like, we can't judge a book by its cover in the sense wow. that you not, I, I just recently heard a, a celebrity talking about this and you think about um, celebrities even who have uh, taken their lives and, but they've yes. been the, the, the comedic, they've been the light for folks and you see them smiling and you think they've got it all together. But when, when you become this vulnerable to share that, yeah. it, it breaks down so many walls for so many people. It's like, and just, I mean, super quickly, it's also like, to me, it, you know, having been an influencer, someone in the public or I, you know, social media, all this stuff for so long, when you've been through, you know, the online bullies and the people that like to judge based on a a curated photo, that's a total highlight reel. Of course, I would never deny that. I also love sharing raw stuff like my skin with no makeup, but it's like, some people are just so quick to judge. And when you have been through the bullying and the judging, you have so much compassion for maybe a celebrity or other influencer, because you know what it's like just to be ripped apart for people who've never met you in person. And they just see one photo of you looking in shape or on, you know, hanging out with these people or on a private, whatever it is. And sometimes the DMs I get from people, it blows my mind. Like, holy cow. I mean, they're just like, of course your life is this because you're a girl because you this and they rip you down to your toes and I'm like well I'm like first of all you 
never met me in person. So I don't think you should judge. You've never met me in person. And also I'm like, until you've spent 24 hours with me and you have seen either how hard I do work for my fitness goals, cause all the blood, sweat and tears. It's like, some people are just so quick to project and be so like hurtful and it's easy behind a screen. That's easy. But that stuff never, it blows my mind. The comments that people make about, oh, you have this because of this. And I'm like, dude, maybe before you like project, maybe take 30 seconds and think, is this mean comment towards this girl that I've never met? Is this going to make me feel any better about myself? Like some people are just really not doing the inner work and they project, 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 bully, bully, bully. And I'm like, what, what does that do for you? Like, yeah. No, you said it right there, right? Like they're not doing the work and, and you being so seeped in the work, you can sort of overstand yeah. and not, not really let it hit you like that because honestly, it, it really is a reflection of their own self-perception and what totally. they're on you is something that they feel is a defi deficiency within themselves, right? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I, I appreciate you sharing that, especially uh, for others who might be, uh, in the same lane as you or starting mm -hmm. to pursue their own track of um, being motivational speakers to to hear you say that is something that I'm sure is encouraging them in their journey so thank you of course yeah let's let's hear our final tips what you got for us yeah so um uh so about four years ago I had bell palsy I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with, with what bell palsy is is basically um, where half of your body gets paralyzed due to stress. Because uh, when I initially started doing this work, it's been around eight years now, but the first four years was me just going, going, going. I was like, the world is ending. We got to fix this problem. <laughs> and I took the whole problem uh, as like, this is something that I have to do. You know, I, I was weird about how bad the problem was and I was all in. Uh, and then one day I was I was literally just in my dining room, just eating and then, my hand was was just like, just fell and my face started drooping. And I was like, wait, what the heck? Am I dying? And I, you know, got rushed to the hospital. And then they're like, oh, it, it's fine. It's it, it's just stress. Yeah, you know, just sleep more and rest more. So now I'm a huge advocate for people being very intentional about sleeping. Uh, and, you know, if, if it's eight hours, just be very intentional about it. Because at the end of the day, um, we don't even know whether we're going to wake up tomorrow. So you've done what you can do today. Go to bed, get the rest you need, and then wake up the next day and do it again. Because I was able to learn just the effects of burnout, you know, you know, stress, and how much that impacts us as, as human to a point that a burnout brain is similar to someone who has Alzheimer's, which is mm -hmm. mind-blowing to me. And I was like, what? And so it was really bad for me to a point that you know, I, 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 I like remember the doctor telling me that, you know, like my like hippocampus was, was like shrinking because I, I was not sleeping. I was drinking coffee. Like I still I still drink coffee at 7 p.m. at 7 p.m. Right. I think it's 7 p.m. in my time. Oh, uh, but I try to make sure that I stop at 7 p.m. because I do love coffee, too. Uh, and then after eight, I have this jug of water that I keep drinking just to, you know, like wash the whole thing out of my system and be able to go back to bed. Uh, so to me, the tip that I that I I always give is like just rest, just just sleep. You know, you know, though the world is very chaotic, there's millions of people out there working. We're all literally doing the same thing in so many different variations. So you taking a break, there's someone else in a different time zone that's doing what we're doing right now, uh, yeah. and to have peace with going to going to bed and and just having that break. So just sleep. You know, I, I have this event that I do just called, it's called Sleep, bro. <laughs> you know? and, and, and it's focused on just, you know, talking about sleep and talking about just the scary portion, which is how much it impacts your brain to a point that your like corpus callosum it actually has less white blood, <laughs> you know, like white cells to make sure that, you know, you know, like signals are going through your body and actually letting your, your body knows that, hey, we're supposed to do this, supposed to do that. So we're having less of those signals if we don't sleep. So to me, you know, that's one of the tips that I give whenever I have talks. I close with that, which is just sleep, bro. It's it's going to be fine. The world is going to be fine. Mother nature will always figure out uh, how to keep going. And we yeah. as that's, that's going to be someone every day waking up and saying, I need to do this work. Uh, and the internet will always tell you that everything is bad. 
Uh, yeah. and, and I try to remind people, do not identify with what you put on the internet, what you do. It's just a different variation and a very tiny portion of who we are as a human being, as a person. Uh, and whatever is coming at us, it is what it is. Let's just leave it at that. Uh, and that's also an experience that we're we're in it and we're part of the massive system. But at the end of the day, we can always just unplug from it and go to sleep. Go to sleep. Go water. Go to sleep. I love that. It's so simple, but so um, Im important and impactful, right? Mm -hmm. um, in a society where the hustle and bustle coming mm -hmm. from... Um, families where some of us inherited you know um poverty i'm trying to see what, what's the term i'm going to use but that sense of trying to make something out of nothing right it makes you hustle bustle even mm -hmm. if you're in corporate america or, or in any sort of like institution there's that you know make sure you come in give a hundred percent nine to five, then you're in traffic, like then you're trying to do things at night and then you don't really get your sleep, but I'm young, I don't need it. There's so many things in our society that tell us that sleep is not important. But mm -hmm. I love that reminder that sleep and rest is actually part of the hustle, yeah. right? Because if you don't do that, then your body, your mind is on go, 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 because you can in some ways control that or, or keep that adrenaline going. But when your body shuts down and you shared your story, thank you for sharing that there's, there's nothing your mind can do. So right. knowing that all of it is connected um, and, and it brings me back to, I think it's Angelica who, who talked about working out or Megan mentioned working out. And I, I love the morning workout because it does actually activate and awaken the brain. And we don't necessarily always think about that, but like rest is part of the hustle. And that has been a message for me as a professional that I have taken the reins on, um, especially when I moved from working the nine to five to more of an entrepreneurial track and now teaching as well. Um, I, I make no exceptions. Megan, I think you were the one who shared it too. Like whatever's going on, like my health comes first, right? Um, so thank you. I'm glad we heard from everyone because I think we got a lot of good bits and pieces for the self tips and we want people to leave here with some reminders. Maybe they were doing it and they stopped and it's like, I got to pick this back up or I've never thought about that. Uh, whatever the case is, we needed to hear that. Um, but now that y'all have segued me into the work mode, uh, I want to ask, and we're going to take on this question in two forms. We're going to talk about these co these conversations in the professional setting, but then I also want us to think about it on the personal level, right? Because it's different approaches, there's different uh, levels of what's acceptable and appropriate, right? To, to talk and discuss their different dynamics of relationships when you think professionally and personally as well. So what... Can you, uh, actually, I know I said we're going to start with the work, but first, how do we approach mental health discussions with friends and family who, forget being skeptical or unsupportive, like they just don't even have the interest, they don't have the knowledge and skill sets, especially for y'all who have, you know, studied this these things, you're working these things, you're living and breathing what you're out there teaching. Um how do you bring this into normal at ground level conversations with family and friends? Megan, was that your hand? Oh, yeah, I'll go first. So that's a great question, um, Dr. Barros. I think, how do I normalize the conversation with family and friends? I think number one, it's just knowing that um you are not alone and i think when you this is being an adult you realize um everyone has their own ups and downs life is not linear okay life is like this so understanding that it doesn't matter how much money you make the fame the cars the anything you're still a human and mental health does not discriminate it affects everyone um and i think Everyone has their own struggles, whether it's imposter syndrome, anxiety, depression, bipolar, um, body dysmorphia, eating disorder, like, you know, grief, losing a loved one. We've all been there in some form. 
but I think it's just like <clears throat> being that person to start the conversation. If you feel like you grew up in a family where either you did talk about mental health or you didn't, you got to realize that it's like, why don't like, why not you? I always say that. Why not you? You know, if you are thinking, oh my gosh, I feel like I'm alone and no one. It's like, but ask yourself, why not you though? Why are you not the one to be that person in the group and to be that one to be like, hey, you know, are you okay? Or, hey, I saw your Instagram post and you look like you're doing awesome in life. Or, hey, I'm proud of you. Like, be that person. Don't wait for someone else to read your mind. You know, be that person to go do that thing. And then you never know the ripple effect it will have. It could change someone else's life. And I've had many experiences in my own life where I, someone impacted me with just a comment or a photo or a, they said something and it changed my excuse me. And it changed my whole entire life. And I, I it, like, it changed the trajectory of my whole entire life. And I would not be the woman that I am today without that like message or photo or anything. So I think my best tips would be you start the conversation, you know, initiate it. It doesn't have to be big and scary too. I think mental health for some people can be like the wizard of Oz where it feels like this grand, scary, intimidating thing. And then you peel back the curtain it's just a man with a microphone. You know what I mean? Like mental health, when you take away, peel away the layers of toxic taboo and stigma and like peel all those layers away at the core, it's like, you just realize it's, there's, there's a root cause of that. There is probably the timeline of mental health stuff. A moment happened, boomed, you know, tra traumatic experience or whatever, boom, thing happened, ripple effect, emotions after that uh coping skills i'm gonna bottle it or do this and then onward the next chapter but you have to realize um <clears throat> that it's like you got to realize that you're just so not alone and especially with family um it's really important to to be that person and you can ask you know hey how are you doing i you know your breakup or like how are things in your marriage and i don't know i think sometimes as humans we often think that uh, the grass is greener on the other side, but I will say sometimes in life, not to sound negative, but sometimes it's not always greener. I think like, it's like on the outside looking in, like as a single female at 28, sometimes, you know, of course I get all comparing and I feel so like, when am I going to meet my person? And I, that's a whole thing, you know, my, the guys I've dated and the love life stuff. And I feel like for me, I'm like, sometimes being a single female, you look at marriages and people that have met their person and you're like, oh my gosh, you know, I bet you feel X, Y, Z and you probably like have arrived and you feel so this, but you got to realize that it's like, sometimes, you know, we think the grass is so much greener. And of course, I'm sure that marriage and finding your person, for example, brings a lot of emotions like stability and you can land the plane a little bit. You feel like you could breathe because dating is so up in the air, but marriage is still effort. It's still work, you know, just because you have a ring or you signed a certificate or you went to a courthouse or you had a wedding, or I think in life, sometimes we think one side, right. But you have to realize just because you have, you're married and stuff that takes a lot of conscious effort. You know, you got to flirt with your partner, go on dates, talk about stuff, have important conversations. And like my parents have been married for like 32, 31 years. And it takes nothing but consistent effort. I choose you every day. You're the love of my life, like all the time. So I think long story short, it's just my best tip would just be to be your, to know that you're not alone. And sometimes the grass is not greener on the other side. And of course, as humans, we think like, oh, that looks so great. And that, that's like, realize that where you're at is pretty awesome too. Uh, and it's like, we all, everyone has their own timeline too. Are you kidding? Some people, get married at 22 some people get married at 35 and we all have different timelines and I think comparison is just like the thief of joy too you know yeah you've you've said so much you said <laughs> so much I can, I'm a talker too when I have when I have my caffeine in the morning I'm like here we go hey <laughs> <laughs> well you're talking good stuff so we welcome it I, yeah. I want to open it up uh, before any comments from myself or anyone else who wants to add to that and feel free to take it to the professional realm as well so we can explore both angles Thanks. yeah and just to add I'm so, I apologize just to add one more thing I unfortunately I have to run um I did want to stay the full 90 minutes but I don't think I can is that I didn't want to be rude but 
No, we appreciate you. Um, yes. You've offered us some some final um, remarks. I, I I think one thing I'd love to hear from you, and then I'll, I'm going to yes. end with this question with folks, but we're going to just pin it for the rest of us. But before you leave, Megan, what just hearing you speak, you you sparked this question for me, like, what do we wish we were told or like, how do we wish people spoke to us about mental health um, hmm. growing up that that could have, you know, made this journey a little less rocky uh, to get to this point? What what are some things, messages or anything that you can think of that like, I wish somebody would have told me this sooner or would have talked to me about mental health this way um, when I was younger? That's a great question. Um... I would say, man, I mean, I, to be honest, I feel like I had a great child. I got really lucky. And when you become an adult, you, your perspective shifts and your eyes open to the whole world. And you realize that not everyone thinks the way that you think and operates because everyone has different childhoods and different families that they grow up in. And I feel very grateful for my upbringing because I got really lucky. Um, I grew up in a really positive, very like loving heard I felt heard seen and understood all the time by my parents they really did a great job of holding the space and my dad was a great strong male father figure like they did a fabulous job so I think I but I I mean I would say one one thing I wish was like taught maybe or told I think um hmm I would say just to adapt to every season of life. That's something because I think being an entrepreneur is just, you know, sometimes we think our life is going to turn out, you know, one way, like, oh, I'll be married by 25 and have the white picket fence and I'll be pregnant. And it's great to have goals. It's amazing. But I think, um, you know, at 28, I, I'm the career girl. I have it all. But then like, for example, yeah, like my love life is something I always feel so insecure about. And I, constantly compare and I feel not good enough and I feel so like my timeline and just all that stuff but I think I wish I knew just to adapt because every city I've lived in every chapter of my life and being 25 and 26 and 27 offers so many different experiences and in every season of life you're gonna probably like look different and feel different and you know you'll be single and then dating and then maybe married and living in this city and I think it's just to adapt to what is to what is now and to kind of honor this season of life is teaching me xyz right like I'm being taught about forgiveness or self-love or uh grief is teaching me a lot because I lost a loved one whatever it is it's just I think learning how to adapt yeah 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 and part of your purpose right now is to to impact and influence others right oh, but, but yeah what I'm, hearing, what I'm hearing from you too is let's not allow society to define what is success and happiness for us yes when when that happens for us yeah right? and and like you said be in the now yeah it's very true but yeah yeah thank you so much thank take you guys. care don't make Thank sure you. That before you leave, maybe just drop in the chat how folks can connect with you. Of course, we'll make sure yeah. that uh, folks can connect with you regardless. But for whoever's here live with us, drop any handles okay. or any folks can connect with you. Yes, I will put all of my stuff. But um, thank you. I mean, everyone for having me and Brandon and um, Dr. Barros. I've had a lovely time and it's been so fun meeting the other um panelists and this is just a great way to spend a Wednesday I think um this has been so much fun and I don't know I think um excuse me as I type this really quickly I think um life is uh yeah and when I sorry you guys so I put everything in the chat box my Instagram I have the same handle for everything so at Megan W. Gallagher is my Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. I'd say those three apps, I'm the most, Instagram is for sure my number one most frequently used. If you DM me, I'll answer. Um, but yeah, I think, I mean, this has been so fun. And I feel so grateful for having been able to like share some tips and tools. And one thing I love about my line of work and being able to talk about this is 
you realize we are never done learning as humans. It doesn't matter what, how old you are, what you've achieved, what accolades. That's we are it. never done learning. We're always going to be students of life. And it's great when you can have an open mindset to be like, yeah, you know, we're always, I mean, until you're 95 years old, you're still going to be learning about relationships and about health and love and happiness. And I think, so yeah, I'm so grateful for today because I absorbed so much of what all of you amazing panelists talked about. And I can't wait to follow all you guys on Instagram um, and stay connected. But thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for your contributions and your expertise. Really appreciate everything you offered. Yes. We look forward to reconnecting soon. Yes, thank you guys. Have a great rest of the panel. I'll talk to you guys later. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Yes. So we're, we're going to do just a couple more rounds, y'all. I, I do want to bring it back to, because we want to give people some encouragement and some tips around Let's just normalize, like maybe we need to stop calling it mental health, right? Like, or just what are we doing? What are we trying to um, sort of get to when we talk about normalizing these conversations and how do you do it, <clears throat> excuse me, with your loved ones, your family and friends versus in the professional setting? Anyone want to jump in? Okay. Hi. Yeah. So, um, I, um, I did, I did like touch on this a little bit, but, um, I can go deeper into it. Um, uh, on a personal level, I spent a lot of time telling my story, uh, yeah. cause I, I, I believe that, you know, especially family and people that have been in my life and in my environment, sometimes when they hear my story, they can relate to it faster. Uh, and as someone being a black dude, I, I also have that, uh, you know, ability to connect with other Black individuals. And, and I think within our community, we don't talk about mental health enough. Like, uh, you know, I have a lot of friends that, you know, they think it's corny that I talk about <laughs> mental health all the time. And, you know, and I also put together events uh, on a personal level where, you know, they're they're very fun. And I, and I try to tap into different creative aspects. I don't just depend on just sitting down and talking. I even have a battle where we dance battle, uh, which is is designed around just uh, dancing and letting your emotions take over. And you show that through the way you dance. Because I, um, I, I, I was a musician at some point in my life where, again, I was lost. I was, I was a drummer. Uh, and I just joined a band and just travel over the U.S. So I tried to tap in different avenues uh, where we can talk about, you know, ways to cope but we do it through music because not everyone has the ability to talk to That's just awesome. share what they feel so sometimes yeah. you see someone dance and literally cry it's 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 mind-blowing seeing someone you know uh, showing their emotions through their movements which is amazing to 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 create a space where people can do that um and another way that i go about it you know we we do painting you know we, we do something called the kendrick listening series that's why earlier i had to just established that I'm a Kendrick fan <laughs> but but the Kendrick let's not, not even go there no just kidding. <laughs> I'll go there. but yeah so I do something called the Kendrick listening series so like Brandon actually flew into Kansas City to be a part of that is where we actually play music by Kendrick Lamar because yeah. Kendrick has songs uh, beautifully you know explaining how all of these different ways of uh, you know like mental illnesses that people go through and how it impacts people that are within the family. So we would play a song. Uh, and the last one we did was uh, called, you know, we played a song called Father Time. And it was about him talking about just the abuse that his mom, uh, uh, you know, experienced and him having to see that as a kid and how that impacted him, uh, which, which is a different perspective because usually it's coming directly from the source. Even though his mom, you know, made sure that he was fine and protected him, but still his mom's fears impacted him. Uh, so this is something that, I, you know, we like played the song. I had this really cool DJ with dreadlocks. He like mixed the whole thing. And then we talked about it. You know, we had a therapist that was there moderating the conversation. So that's also another, uh, you know, thing that I do on a personal level to make sure that, you know, people can can find connection through those music or art uh, and all the different avenues to be able to talk about uh, mental health. And another one that I do is called the T-Rex Suicide Awareness Walk. Uh, and it's designed for people to wear a T-Rex costume. Uh, the goal is to have 130 people across the U.S. 
wearing a tourist costume one day. Right now, the we we had thirteen people as the biggest. Uh, it's been two years. We have thirteen people wearing costumes, and they they're all like stream from different locations. And the idea is to just talk about the word suicide because most of the times people just want to get hurt. They just want to hear people say the word itself uh, and, and realize that this is not something that I am going through personally. It's something that everyone is going through. So, you know, th th this is something that I, I personally focus on to make sure that, you know, we, we're not just talking about mental health in a setting where there's chair. Sorry, my dog just like... <laughs> uh, you know, I'm not talking about in a in a place <laughs> in a in a space that it's just like we're talking at people. I want it to be more engaging, just so that we can you know we can create a space for conversation and connections. People to come in and have you know and do things that they're already doing in normal day to day and things that they enjoy to do, and just talk about mental health at the same time. You know, it it goes a long way because people are attaching that experience to mental health and it's changing the language, it's changing the way that we see it. It's, it's no longer like, oh, this is a heavy thing. Now it's more so this is a, a space we can go and, and be our true self, but then actually have something that we can remember and be like, this is mental health. Uh, this is how it sh you know it should be in my in my own personal opinion. And then on the pers you know on the business side, it took me four years to even get understood. Like business people didn't get it. Because to them, they're like, just do a workshop and talk about this. Um, you know, um, we're about to do something. Uh, you know, it is a workshop, but we're we're actually playing a, a kid show. So the the film that's coming out about feelings and emotions, and uh, I've I, I I can't remember the title for some reason, but it's this really remarkable film that you know I watched with my son a long time ago. And now I, I try to bring that into professional spaces because it talks about childhood trauma, but uh, at a, such a high level. Uh, but it's it's a kid's show, so it looks very silly. So ba basically, the workshop is designed for you know employees to come in to learn about culture, to to like you know talk about DEI because that's being attacked nowadays. <laughs> and as me, who is working in the media, who work in the media space, I do have a finance degree, so I I'm, I'm very in tune with finance in general. And how if we don't get our ish together as a community and the way that the population is is eventually will become the most diverse community, if we don't talk about it now, uh, it's going to be a massive problem in the future because we need to make sure that these diverse communities are educated in finances, mentally healthy and all these different areas that makes up a society. So this is what I bring to the professional space uh, where I do this, you know, like workshops. It's your normal workshop, but it's not your normal workshop. That's how I describe it, uh, you know, because I, I I make jokes and I tell people, wear a tuxedo. And they actually showed up with their tuxedo, which is funny. One time I say, wear shorts and people, everybody wear shorts, you know, it's, it, but it, it's a, it's a, it's a work, you know, you know, like workshop designed to engage the employees. And, and we have silly games every now and then. I had a CEO, uh, had so much fun that we had a picture of him jumping over a cup, like with his tongue out. But, <laughs> and then he like emailed us, please, can you send me that picture? I want to share it with my kids that I know how to do the MJ tongue out. I didn't even know what he was doing, but apparently it, it was something super cool to him. Uh, so, you know, just try to be fun, uh, try to be more engaging and make sure that when we talk about it on a, uh, on a personal level, we meet people where they are because mental health at the end of the day, it's, I feel like it's getting redefined every day and we are all part of that definition to make sure that people are you know uh, are coming into this space and learning about themselves but in a in a in a very empathetic way and then on the business side we, we need to understand that the businesses they have the bottom line at the end of the day they have they have stakeholders shareholders and we need to know, uh, figure out how to fit into their programs or whatever they have going on or at the end of the day they don't really care like that's just the fact they don't care is because to them they just want to get that expenses checked at the end of the day. So we need to make sure what do they have right now? How can I make it more engaging, more interactive? Uh, yeah, it's 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 something that I'm defining every day, changes all the time. Ask Brandon. We've had multiple events that I had to literally change the whole, uh, you know, you know, the entire concept. I'm hey bro, like sorry, you have to cancel your flight. We we, or, you know, this doesn't make sense. This is what's happening now. So that you know, at the end of the day, that I'm I'm defining something with with businesses, with individuals, with with a community, 
So it's it's something that I see myself as, you know, someone who's just conducting and then listening to people and 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 all right, this is what what what's need to be, you know, needed to be done. Because I have my personal experiences and everybody has their own experiences. And we have to have that space of empathy, that space of grace to let people chime in in order for us to create a solution together. At least that's my own personal, uh, you know, take on the whole problem. Oh, I think you're, you're on mute. Am I on mute? Okay. Oh, yeah, we can hear you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Barris. I was like, am I on mute? Okay, you guys can hear me, right? <laughs> I was like, I said all this and no one heard me. <laughs> Oh my god. I still am mute. Let me see. Well yeah, I guess we can move to the next person and while we figure out the audio. Yeah, I loved what you were saying. And as you were speaking, what came to my mind was meeting people where they're at. And then you literally said it. So that was really cool and powerful um, for me. But I think personally and professionally, meeting people exactly where they're at is what we have to do as people in this space. It's energy is contagious. How we show up to hard conversations is really powerful. And if we come in with our own agenda and what we want to do and how we want to change, I think it's losing the meaning behind what we want to do. So meeting people where they're at and being curious on where they're at, I think is really important. The questions we ask, how we sit and talk to them, um, how we engage with them, it's all meaningful. And so as people in this space, we just need to be really aware of how we show up to these hard conversations. It's powerful. Yes, and I think- She's back. I think. Oh no, we can't hear you again. Or is it just me? No, we, uh, you know, okay. she, she, she was like, uh, uh, I, you know, like, for like a brief second, I think, or is it in my head? No, she was definitely there, <laughs> unless it was in my head too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's a mic problem. Oh, someone says mic issue. Oh, that's fair. Yeah, I guess I guess we can go to Angelica. Angelica, sorry, I just said your name. Yeah. Yes. It it it's the 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 system is telling us we've got to wrap this up. <laughs> Oh, we can go all night about these these conversations. So many layers. Um. So so let me let me get to my final question, but I do want to touch on a, a couple of things that um, Ibrahima, right? Ibrahima, I have to get it right because I hate when people butcher my name. So, um, oh my goodness, you touched on one thing. You touched on for me is the historical legacies, and you mentioned about um, Black culture, and I don't want to speak in general terms because we're not a monolith. But there is, I think, a, another layer in a historical legacy, right, that contributes to this resistance or um, lack thereof engaging in mental health, right? Your approaches to meet people where they are, but thinking about it beyond oral communication and expression and getting to the music really spoke to me because I'm like, let's be honest, for... Uh, generations, right? Black folks have not been um, originally not considered a full human being, originally not um, able to be educated, to learn how to read. If you, you can't even read, how do you know how to express? And then when it comes to that emotional intelligence and being able to even be aware of what you're feeling, identify and express it, but because of survival, strategies our parents have not been able to live in 
some of those traumas because life goes on, right? And we have to make sure kids are fed and what have you. Um, but how do we expect now that we know about mental health or things have evolved in our society and access is open to more people um, that we should just show up and stop practicing because this is the right thing. We don't have the know-how. So when you create spaces where I can go and sit and listen to a Kendrick Lamar and help hear him processing his own emotions actually starts teaching me how to identify because when I can relate, I can then put a name to that feeling and that emotion. And now my knowledge and language starts to develop. So then, then maybe I might get that courage to go have the conversation with a parent or a sibling um, where there's some discourse. And then even knowing how to manage if, if it's not reciprocated or welcomed when you, you know, have that expression. The, the dance piece, when you don't even have those words and you can sort of like work through some emotions to sort of have these breakthroughs, like th those are all so powerful and beautiful. And I'm, I'm just wanting to reiterate it to folks to say that there's different ways to approach this. Um, and like someone said earlier, it's not all about the Instagrammable moments of, of having your face mask or getting your nails done or whatnot. Um, but they, we do have to recognize um, sort of how we got here, right? Um, the other piece, um, I think those were the major ones with, with what you shared that I wanted to name and, and really appreciate your, your approach and then how to normalize that in the workplace. A lot of the thing with the workplace is just um, the expectations and the standards around professionalism and how you should show up and you know um, power dynamics that come into play as well. And so when you're able to show a company uh, that your employees well-being does contribute to that bottom line, then I think we can start having these types of um, this normalization rather happening at work in in your you know homes in your communities and then so then that sort of attack from all angles can truly get us to some normalization so with with that um i do want to pose the question to y'all that i sh asked of uh, megan before she left what is it that we wish we would have known sooner or something that was never even like told to you, um, like even in what you just shared about the different forms of expression could have been like, where somebody could have told me there's different ways to go about this than just, you know, talking and pouring out the bad things in my life, you know, um, what, what would that be? And maybe it's not something you would have known, but some type of experience you wish you could have even had sooner in life. What would you say that is? Yeah, so 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 for me, you know, even till today, everything that I do is based upon what I wish I had as a kid, which was, you know, I wish because I spent so much time in school. I was I was a very smart kid. I I skipped two grades, uh, and I would travel to like competing spelling bees. I was a very nerdy kid. Basically, that's what I'm saying. Uh, so I I remember, you know, it, 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 even the curriculum that I'm that that I currently have within school districts. Uh, is designed to to educate kids at a young level to have the language of how to communicate if if you are experiencing something um, um, something I, I'm I, and again I'm trying to be mindful of people's mental state because there are things happening um, in our lives as as kids and we don't have the language to communicate and let other people know that this is happening so the the curriculum is designed to educate kids as they progress through the school system from K to twelve. Uh, and is it's called FEM education, so fostering emotional maturity. And the reason why I called it FEM, uh, it's it's very like strategic because again, usually when I have this discussion, I'm in a room full of men, uh, so I called it FEM. So normally, even when I have those meetings with like superintendents, when I say FEM education, they're like, "Why do you call it FEM?" I was like, "That's my point." You, you should go see a therapist but uh, so because yeah, to them it's like femme they're like female you know it's it's you know there's something there subconsciously us men that 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 sometimes when we hear something that is is done by a woman we 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 sometimes don't see value in it it's super weird 
Uh, and any you know, if there's so much research done, I I can't actually cite those researches. So I'm gonna be mindful of how much how much I share. But that but there are research done around this. And and just a few days ago in Kansas City, we had like one of our top players went out and just did a whole speech about how like you know he was talking to a room full of women that just graduated and he was telling them that they should stay uh you know they should be honored that they have the ability to stay home be moms and parents and i was like this is this dude is insane and and i almost had him in my documentary so i was like yep cutting this guy off he needs to go see a therapist too uh so yeah it's like having that language and that understanding at a very young age how we educate kids about math and and like science and all these other things i, I think mental health should be included in the curriculum that's why i didn't even use mental health as the name of the curriculum i called it fem education Fostering emotional, uh, um, sorry, I need to, I need water. Fostering emotional maturity, so that they can foster that maturity emotionally as they're progressing, and have the language to not say dumb stuff that, uh, you know, uh, you know, like Harrison Butker just said, and and things that it ha it happens in, you know, men only spaces because you know there's some really wild stuff that men feel comfortable to say when we're hanging out just by ourselves. And how having those language to call each other, hey, like that's not okay. Like, why would you talk about uh, talk about someone like that? So these yeah. are things that I am hoping I mean, that I've always wished that I had as a kid, so that I have the language to tell my parents. Probably not my parents because they were not the best role model in my childhood. But I did have a really cool uncle. I could have let him know what was happening in my life. Yeah, uh, but I didn't know what to say or how to say, so I just kept quiet. Uh, cause my, my, my dad specifically did not let me talk back and it became a, a habit where to a point that it developed into a stutter. So my whole life I had a stutter until when I was 23, I'm now 32. So that's why I talked with my hands cause it was a part of my, uh, when I saw a therapist and, a, and like a, you know, like a speech pathologist or whatever uh, they call themselves. But basically she, uh, trained me to talk with my hands to help my body, I'm moving the 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 words in my body just to be able to talk because my whole life I had a stutter, uh, and now you know it's like I didn't have the language my whole life. I was I was suppressed to not speak up uh, my whole life. So uh, I I've I've always wished that we taught kids how to regulate our emotions, how to understand what's happening in our environment, and be able to speak up to the teacher, to our uncles, to someone in our life that actually wants something good for us. Uh, but yeah, that's why I have two cents. You're bringing us back to self-awareness, self-regulation, to self-accountability, right? And I love the approach. Um, mental health is, is up here and there's associations up with that comes with it. And so you're just bringing it to the basics of what it is you're actually, you know, focused on in, in developing. So I think that's a great call out for um, professionals and people who are creating space. So I appreciate that. Um, why don't you go ahead and drop in the chat your contacts so folks can reach out to you as well as we hear from um, either Angela and Angelica, sorry, or Ashley, who would like to go next. I'll go next because my answer is very similar to what Abrama was sharing. I love that that's what you're doing for work because I have always said that mental health education is missing from the curriculum and it doesn't need to be called that because like you said, that term is scary, um, but just include it in like our health classes. Talk about emotional regulation, self-awareness, how to actually take care of ourselves because that's something I never, ever heard growing up in school. And like you, I also had, I struggled. I, started speaking very late as a kid. So I had a lot of problems with tantrums because I couldn't communicate what I wanted to say. So I guess like I was taught some of that in my like speech therapist class and things like that. But in the actual school curriculum, there was never anything about self-care or how to carry yourself or how to regulate what's going on with you and outside of you in the outer world, how to control what you can control kind of thing. A lot of that I've learned through life experiences, which I'm very grateful for, but um, I think we can do a much better job of preparing our youth and our kids with the skills and the tools that they need in order to succeed. So a bit of a cop-out, but my answer is the exact same as yours. No, yeah, definitely not a cop-out, a great call-out, because I think some of that is, is unfortunately very intentional um, if we think about um, hierarchy in our society. So 
I love that call out. We're going to keep calling that out and finding ways to get into these institutions and organizations for sure. Ashley, you want to uh, end it up, end it out for us? Yeah, absolutely. So mine is going to be a little different and I'm not sure if this is the direction that we wanted to go with this question, but what came to my heart and my mind, which I wanted to call out is you matter. I, I wish that I remembered in all the moments growing up and even sometimes to this day that I matter. And that is, is something that I just want to share in, in all the experiences and all your quirkiness and all your kookiness in all of the things you still matter. And that's kind of how I want to bring us home. <laughs> that's so profound. I love that. Just to have, just to hear that, even sometimes as parents, you know, you, you say you do, you do everything for them because of them, because they do matter. But the fact that you never said it, right, does make a difference. Love that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, make sure you drop your handles. I think I saw all y'all come through in the chat. I just want to say thank you all for being so engaged and open in our discussion. It's truly been inspiring to see such courage and honesty in, in one virtual room. <laughs> um, as we close out this session, let's remember that the conversation doesn't end here. We, we continue on these conversations in our spaces, whether it's at the individual level, within our spheres of influence, or within organizations and at a systemic level, right? The conversations must continue. The insights and stories shared today are just the beginning of what I hope will be an ongoing journey, um, which I know is going to be an ongoing journey for each of you, especially deeply seeped in this work. Um, I definitely want to stress the importance of having accountability partners and professional support throughout your life. Every mentor, um, every mentor needs to be mentored too, right? Needs to be a mentee. Um, and that's for, for life. It's never ending. And when we accept that, then we can expect to continue to do this work daily. Um, let's never underestimate the power of solitude and inner peace and the importance and um, rejuvenation that we get from rest. So as much as we're doing, let's not forget to be still and be restful, to be reflective and connect with yourself so you can deepen that self-awareness. Um, it's not always about pointing the finger and calling people out. It's also important to be able to check yourself and have that positive self-talk. Trust your instincts and your intuition. They are your deepest guides. So often we're looking for guides and, and confirmations from outside, validation from outside. We didn't even talk about how technology um, contributes and, and impacts our mental health. But that's another piece, right? So that, that sense of validation that comes from within is, is our deepest guide. Um, and finally, action is essential, right? So if you're listening to this, thank you for sticking, um, sticking it through all this time with us. And we just encourage you to take action on any one thing or multiple great things you heard today from our amazing panelists. Uh, remember that you're not alone. We heard that loud and clear as well. You're not alone in this journey. Connect yourself. Remember, as you're working to pull others up, that you reach out and grab onto others who can help pull you up as well, right? Um, please feel free to connect with all of us. You see the, the drops in the chat and you'll see it in the captions, but uh, connect with us on social media. Connect, of course, with Mental Health Declassified. Stay connected. We're going to continue this dialogue um, because mental health is a priority for all of us in our lives. So again, thank you all for your participation and your bravery. Together, we are taking an important step towards healing not just ourselves, but our communities. It's been such a pleasure and an honor being in conversation with y'all. Wish y'all a blessed night and an amazing rest of this month, y'all. Focus on your awareness and let's keep doing this 365. All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Good night, everyone. Good night.